the stuff that I want to talk about is on the syllabus and uh, other course materials. Now, first thing I want to teach you about world history first semester, the difference between it and world history second semester. No, there's several, but one of them is world history first semester is like a mosaic. You talk about individual peoples living in isolation of each other. You have people living in far off China, other people living in India, and then you have the American Indians, North American Indians, South American Indians, Europeans, Middle Easterners, and most of them, and Africans, most of them were dimly aware or completely unaware that the other groups of people existed. These peoples living somewhat in isolation. They didn't come together much until the, after the year 1500. So we'll be talking about, uh, first of all, we'll start talking about the Middle East and then go from there to India, from there to China, from there to Europe, Greece and Rome, and from there to the American Indians, from there to Islam, and from there to uh, back to medieval China. Then we'll go to India, Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, then back to Europe again, and end the semester in Europe. Uh, so no, it's basically, it was, We'll, we'll take these individual localities piecemeal. At the end, I want to be able to compare. Comparison was, were these people united? Most peoples have a tendency to stay divided. The Chinese were an exception. China remained united for most of its history. Europe united for oh, about 200 years under Rome, and then fragmented and was never able to unite again. India, oh, they thought they were united. They tried hard to be, but they couldn't unite themselves, except when they were called the foreigners. Foreigners united them. Southeast Asia, they were mountainous, separated by oceans and vast mountains and jungle. They could not unite. I don't think even Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan could have united those people. Too much geography in the way. Um, the North American Indians, they were tribal. They weren't united. The Central American Indians, yeah, they united into big nations. South America, they did have a big empire at one time. But, no, were these people united? Were they not united? And um, just you know, several things we want to compare. What was their philosophy, overriding philosophy, um, as a, compared to other peoples? Uh, where, and yeah, yes, your book emphasizes where did they place women? Were women considered equal? They were in some sense. Were women considered subservient? as it were in a lot of societies, um, and what difference did it make? Uh, believe me, I'm going to have a lot to say about that in the days ahead, but I'm going to skip that for a bit. All right. Um, that's the overview. Now, folk, where does, well, let's see, we'll start off. What is history? All right. If you go to our college, you're going to find a, some study guides for the first pass, and you'll hopefully learn the difference between primary sources and secondary sources. Primary source, a person living at the time saw an event and wrote about it. That's a primary source. Secondary source, people who lived many, many generations later became fascinated with the topic and they wrote about it. A lot of modern day historians write about Alexander the Great, they're all secondary sources. But Alexander carried a biographer with him, a reporter, who recorded all of Alexander's deeds. He is a primary source. We still have a record of him. All right, big difference. History is a matter of reading what ancient peoples or what medieval peoples or what the people of the past said about themselves while they were alive. Then later, persons come along who try to interpret and make sense out of what went on in the past. Written records. Now, that's where history began, the written records. Oh. I have studied myself into a state of confusion as to which civilization was the oldest. At one time, we said that, oh, it was tossed up between Egypt and Babylon. Egypt on the one hand, Babylon on the other. Then we discovered the Sumerians. Then we discovered the Indus Valley. Now we discovered some Costco Indians living in South America. And folk, which one was the oldest? Quite frankly, nobody knows. Nevertheless, the standard view is to start with the Sumerians, even though the Sumerians might have been preceded by the Indus Valley peoples, 
who in turn might have been preceded by the Chinese even, or might have been preceded by the people of Africa, Aksum, Ethiopia. Um, we'll talk about that when we come to Africa. They might have been earlier. But we're going to start with the Sumerians. But before we do, I want to look over what I've written about. Um, no. Particularly, this is true of ancient history. Folk, what you believe about ancient history is a matter of your interpretation. And it is a matter of your worldview. And I have read many, many a book about the subject. The standard view now, which I must teach, because this is, after all, a state of the standard view is that early man was very primitive and he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and climbed slowly, slowly upward. There is an alternate view. That early man was very advanced, his civilization appeared suddenly and full blown, and instead of rising, he fell. In other words, the big issue did man rise or did man fall? Nineteen of you, by my count. All right, that's pretty good. Nineteen. I'll find out who's absent in a minute, if anybody. All right. Now, when I say man fell, folk, if this, if I don't shock you, I have faith. There are persons who will write and insist that early man had airplanes, spaceships, nuclear weapons, devices. Oh yes, brain surgery that was superior to our own, device that put ours to shame, airplanes that could dive underwater and then fly up out of the water. We don't have those. Nobody knows how we could even make it. Well, maybe a rocket plane could do something like that. Um, but it's highly, super highly advanced, and somewhere along the way we lost it. And now, the gods. Very, very, very fascinating topic. Were they figments of man's imagination, something that man needed to make bring water to the universe, so he invented the gods, or were they actual real beings? And I'll focus again. Every ancient society believed that the gods once lived here on earth among men, lived in temples, and even went so far as to cohabit with human women and produce offspring that were hybrid, half God and half man. Now who knows, who was Hercules' father? Everyone. Yes. I mean, I heard several answers. Most of you have heard that. Is it true? I'll let you decide. I found most college students today don't seem to believe it. Even though I will say this, you folk, your generation is much more open to that stuff than my generation. In my generation, every story about witches always had a natural explanation. Supernatural, every TV show and every movie that had seemed to have something supernatural at the end, there was a natural explanation. Harry Potter could hardly have been written when I was a young man. Because Harry Potter doesn't have a natural explanation to the supernatural deeds. But, it wasn't just Hercules. The fact is, Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh is in the book, some of at least one of not here, you've heard of Gilgamesh. He was two-thirds God and one-third human. And he's depicted as holding two lions by their hind legs, one in one hand and one in another. Uh, and he would have had to be 12 or 13, 14 feet tall. I mean, a real giant of a man. These hybrids, by the way, were giants. Super, the half God and half man, a little bit more than uh, man, but less than God. And again, folk, these stories are found in every bit of ancient folklore, including the Bible, by the way, uh, not to mention Chinese literature. All right, so the stories, and this is one of the things that you want you to consider about writing a paper on. The tales our ancestors told, are they serious history? Or are they just simply, and I had a student just last spring write down it, Human beings need fantastic stories to briefly to, oh, to uh, 
We leave the humdrum of everyday life. We need to let our mind wander and daydream a bit. So uh, that's why we like to read stories about Superman and watch movies about Superman or the Avengers, people who have more than natural abilities. Um, so we make up stories. Or should these stories be taken as serious history? All right, now, the dragons. The standard view is that dragons never existed. However, folk, descriptions of dragons, they look very much like, and if there have there were some ancient people who saw them who do, they look very much like what we get when we put dinosaur bones together and make dinosaurs. Are the dragons dinosaurs whom our ancestors actually saw and actually fought? Or are they figments for imagination? Government. Was government something that man invented, or was government imposed on man by human entities, gods who came to earth and told us we should have a government? Uh, again, the origin of kingship, this is something that a, a lot of scholars have delved into. Where did kingship, where did human government originate? Stiff civilizational studies, Sumer, Egypt, Israel, Babylon, the Indus Valley, I mean, you can read it yourself, China, Assyria. Then Babylon again. Uh, Babylon rose and fell and rose and fell and might have risen and fallen three times or more. Um, eventually it was destroyed completely. And some of you might be aware that Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild the city. He died before the project got far. And with Persia, Greece, Japan, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, Rome, Olmec, that's an Indian tribe in Mexico, Aztec, likewise, Inca, Indian tribe in South America. Finally, we'll get back to medieval Europe. Civilized. Now, that word civilized, and it's a difficult word to define. I used to think that it meant the ability to write. It's a little bit more than that. Basically, the word civilized means that you have a society where you have in other words, it's not just food getters. You have uh, different people in different occupations. There's a tanner and working on tanning, and then a cobbler working on uh, shoe making, and uh, a blacksmith making uh, iron for plows and horses, uh, horseshoes. And uh, you know, you have different people in different occupations, but they're joined together by a government system. And the government system was usually headed by a king, and under the king were deputies, nobles. This is civilization, a civil society. You have in the civilization scribes. And um, now, the civilization had to develop a bureaucracy to administer a large territory. Hence, that's what the word civil means, among other things, bureaucracy. To hold and keep that territory, they had to have armies, so the king was usually, was always in charge of an army. Civilizations would come and go. Most civilizations fell. And folk, again, that's one of the two topics for your paper that I picked. What makes civilizations fall? And I had a student ask me last semester, why have we not seen a civilization fall? My answer is, perhaps our civilization has already fallen and we don't know it. It's like in the case of Rome. They had officially say Rome fell in 476, but actually it was long gone, long before then. The people living at the time didn't know it. They were still trying to revive the Roman Empire in the year 800 when they crowned Charlemagne, Roman Emperor. So uh, they did not know that they had fallen. Today, oh yeah, yeah, you fell in 476. Who knows, so for some future time, they may say that the American civilization fell in 2010. That was E.O. Obama here was signing the law. That's something else. I mean, uh, again, um, the civilization, the fall of Rome was so gradual that the people living did not know that it had fallen during the time. Um, some of these civilizations appear to have fallen suddenly, boom, and are out of existence. And sometimes they were destroyed by people from across the sea. In the case of the Incas and Aztecs, the Mayans actually were destroyed before the Europeans arrived. Uh, they were way downhill before the Europeans arrived. The Incas and Aztecs were destroyed by Europeans. 
Um, the fall of the Indus Valley, again, it appears to be really sudden. But another thing about these civilizations, and this is true of all of them, fell. They fell more from within and without. Folk, in the case of the Aztecs, Montezuma had an army of 100,000 men, and Cortez had an army of about 200 men. Pick the winner. Yeah, the winner was Cortez with his 200 men, but he recruited some 50,000 Indians who were discontent to fight for him. And then half of Montezuma's army would not fight. So um, again, they had fallen from within more than from without. And this is definitely true of the Romans. I have a list here of the civilizations that fell and who was responsible for their fall. Again, more from within than without. But um, when we'll talk about each one of these as we come to them. This is just an overview. Um, what you have, folks, throughout much of history, you have an advanced group of peoples living here in bright cities, really good uh, cities, and around them you have a bunch of barbaric people, we'll call barbarians, uncivilized, maybe uncouth. Eventually they struggle, and with a few exceptions, most of the time, folks, the, this may surprise you, the uncivilized wind up winning and taking over the civilized. This was true of the case of Rome, where the uh, Germanic people came in and overpowered Rome. For a while it happened in China, where there's some barbarians from Mongolia, and then barbarians from Manchuria, it's happened in China twice, it overran China. In the case of the Sumerians, barbarians from Arabia overran them. What's the difference? between the civilized and uncivilized folk. The more I've studied, the more I'm convinced that the uncivilized people have more babies than the civilized. They have more children. And eventually, they greatly outnumber the civilized. While the civilized are too busy accumulating wealth, the uncivilized have little to do but have a lot of children. And after a while, now there was an exception. When the Europeans came to North America and they encountered the yeah, North American Indians who I have to consider uncivilized, but simply have to. Indian, North American Indian women did not want to have more than about one or two babies apiece. While European women had 15 and 16 and 17 children very often. In addition, Europeans kept coming in waves. This is one time where the civilized people equipped the uncivilized. It wasn't just that the Europeans had guns. You know, the Indians eventually got the guns and learned how to use them. Yeah, Europeans came with their horses. Well, eventually the Indians got the horses also and became excellent horsemen. But the problem was the Indians were greatly outnumbered. And they had no chance. Once the Europeans arrived in droves, the Indians just kept being... I mean, we'll talk about this also when we come to the chapter on American Indians. Um, now, these civilizations, again, uh, they often became corrupted from within before being conquered without. Now, folk, one reason I'm fascinated with this topic. My very first term paper, my junior year of high school, we were required to write one term paper before we graduated, and I wrote mine on, is American society following in the footsteps of the Roman Empire? I came to the conclusion it was. I wrote this paper in 1966. Um, since then, we have seen we have gone farther and farther downhill as far as, yeah, oh yeah, we're making some changes in some ways. When our morality gets worse, our family life gets worse, Rome had the same problem. And Rome experienced a big population decline. But we'll talk more about this in detail as time goes on. Um, their religion, a lot of the religion tended to change. And um, somewhere along the way. Now, folk, you don't have to believe this, but I personally believe that the original religion of all these peoples was monotheism, the worship of one God. And then it fell. I mean, their religion became a worship of many gods with most people except for very few. And um, 
we begin, we'll, we'll talk about how, why these religions changed and what difference it made when they changed. And uh, eventually Westerners were to kick out all their many gods and adopt Christianity. But in a lot of cases, they start worshiping a god whom they later abandon or barely remember. Most of these ancient peoples did not have a democracy. Greece did for a while, I mean part of Greece, and Rome did for a while. Uh, by the way, if, if I hope most of you in the back can read it, and before the class I stepped in the back for a moment, I could read it. If you can't, you should have your eyes checked. I'm telling you that. Uh, <laughs> yes. I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Uh, I've, I've had two eye surgeries, but two. anyway, I have 20 20 Um, now, anyway, they um, some of these civilizations died out so completely that we don't even remember them anymore. They were forgotten about. The Sumerians forgotten about for 1,500 years. Actually, maybe longer than that. And some of them were discovering. Some of the Indian tribes in North America, we find they had some pretty advanced civilizations. And along the way, they died out. Um, well, yeah, back to democracy. I, folk, suppose the United States is a democratic nation. But I'm going to tell you up front, I no longer believe in democracy as a good viable form of government. But that might sound like heresy. Where it leads to is what some philosopher, and nobody knows who said it, but some philosopher told us right at the beginning of our history that the United States democracy would last until the common person found that he could dip his hand into the public pot and pull money out of the public pot. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyway, we are so deep in debt now that folk will never get out. And eventually our government's going to be falling this moment, right? We keep getting deeper and deeper in. And we recently had some expert, financial experts say that the great decline, the big financial collapse. They keep saying it's going to happen this year. It hasn't happened yet. It might happen soon. It might even be happening right now while I'm talking. Who knows? All right. Uh, but, I mean, you can't keep borrowing, borrowing, borrowing money and spending money you don't have without eventually foreclosing. So your creditors will come into the on you. And guess who our biggest creditor is now? Folks? Everybody is it China? In China. They're not even our friends. They own us. At one time, I mean, when I was a kid, a youngster, like most of you are, the America owed its money to its own citizens. The Chinese have bought up most of our debt. They own us. If it isn't frightening, it should be. All right, so we see a pattern. Fragmentation, a strong man comes on, he brings a few years of peace. The strong man dies, he's followed by a weak, weak, weak ruler. Fragmentation, the cycle begins again. Eventually some strong man comes in and takes over. All right, you get to the term, I want you to know the dynasty. Ruled by a family. Where that a father, the strong father will take over the kingdom. When he dies, he passes the kingdom on to his son. The average dynasty only lasts about three to four generations. Now, some dynasties have lasted a lot longer. The Japanese have a dynasty going right now that's lasted at least 2,600 years. They haven't changed dynasties in all that time. But generally, what you get is some ruler who's just simply not capable of handling it. And someone who's strong takes over. Um, medieval, I mean, Western European civilization and Muslims are different in that they have not yet fallen. Um, all right. Again, you can read some of this for yourself, the civilization and who conquered them. Um, you can, we're going to be talking about this in more detail. Now, some of the terms I want to introduce you to, I will start off with what we call primitive man, prehistoric man. Now, folks, 
this is not my view personally. I mean, I suspect that mankind started off very, very high, but we're supposed to picture man as living in caves to begin with. And I want to say this about cave people. Every generation of humanity has had cave people. And we have people living in caves today, some of whom own cell phones or iPads or laptop computers. In Europe, we have caves where they have high quality oil paints with high quality oil paint. What does this tell you about the society they did? I mean, do you see a cave and on a picked on the walls, the cave is a picture of high quality artwork with high quality oil paint? It tells you these people are on the fringe of a more advanced society. Just like if you see a person living under a bridge, and we have bridge people right here in Atlanta, and he's calling somebody on his uh, cell phone. Tells you he's living on the fringe of people who are more advanced than he is. Yeah, we do have people who live under bridges who own cell phones. Um, so, but yes, we've always had cave. Maybe the Paleolithic, Old Stone Age, supposedly that was the most primitive people. Mesolithic, Middle Neolithic, New Stone Age. Australopithecus, he supposedly was not quite human, but uh, human like. You know, supposedly he was developing into a human. Now, again, your authors picture the origin of man as being evolutionary. They do that. And again, you can make up your mind for yourself what you believe about evolution. Um, if you want to discuss it, I'm willing to. Uh, now, on a personal note, I think that evolution is, is being taught, as Charles Darwin taught it, is genetically impossible. The DNA has completely disproven it to the point where I mean, uh, DNA guarantees that a person, as any species, whether plant or animal, can only mate up with individuals of his own species that have the same genetic information lined up in the same way. And now, what if some member develops some new genes? Well, number one, this has never been observed. But number two, unless he met a member of his own species, they had the same genes located in the same place. They generate for an end right there. And I said, all right, I'm trying to teach fundamental biology, folks. Um, but to me, all right, oh yeah, if evolution were true, genes would have to be removed from one chromosome to another, or moved to a different place on the same chromosome. Well, anyway, if an individual did have his genes all of a sudden move from chromosome one to chromosome 22, Unless he made a member of the opposite sex that had the exact same genetic defect, the generation would end right there. So in other words, in order for a pair of chimpanzees to produce a human, they had to produce two of them, one male and one female. It had to be an all at one bang. So it's, that's called punctuate. And a lot of evolutionists, they punctuate equilibria. There would have had to have been at least 45 million genetic changes take place in one generation, from father to son or from mother to daughter, one generation. And folks, that's just virtual. Nevertheless, sorry, if you want to argue, I won't argue in class, I'll argue with you online. <laughs> I mean, we have, we have, we got a lot to cover, but I will, I will, I will debate it. I mean, you know, I teach evolution when I'm talking about Darwin and when I'm talking about the Scopes trial. And I actually outlay it, outline it, you know, genetically what has to be. Um, hey, you want to change from an animal with an ordinary neck to a giraffe, it's not just the neck you have to change, you have to change its bone structure, and it has to get nerves that can go to its brain, but also a giraffe is unique. And when he raises his head to eat leaves off a tree, his blood pressure is one thing, and then when he lowers his head down to water, blood pressure on his brain remains the same. There's no other mammal that has that quality about it. No, otherwise, see, if he uh, tried to lower his knees and get down the water, when all that blood rushed to his head, he'd die instantly of a stroke. But instead, he has a circuit, I might call it a circuit, a computer device in his makeup, uh, what, a, what better term can you use, that keeps his blood pressure on his brain constant, whether he's stretching out to get leaves off a tree or kneeling down to lap water from a lake. So in order, it's just a matter of, you make one change, you have to make it follow up with another change, with another change, with another change, with another change, with another change. Hundreds of thousands of changes have to take place to 
to get any kind of change at all. All right, but anyway, your authors take the standard view, and I mean, I mentioned evolution because, I mean, it is important. It is what is taught. Well, I teach it also. I taught it to my children the same way I'm teaching it to you. All right, any? All right. Now, by the way, I said I'd call roll at 1030. No need to bother. Everybody's here. So uh, I'll proceed. Everybody's going to count in present. All right. Now, the Neanderthal man, that's something else. Both the Neanderthal man and a Cro-Magnon man had a larger brain capacity. Now, what I don't mention, but they also were physically larger than modern man. The average Neanderthal man was six foot tall, and we're, we're getting there right now in America. The average Cro-Magnon man was also six feet tall. Both cases they had a larger brain than now. That doesn't mean necessarily mean they were more intelligent. Even though with a bigger body capacity seems to indicate that they were stronger. And they might very well have had more intelligence. Now, I'm just Cro-Magnon man. I mean, I had a DNA study through National Geographic done a few years ago. They've improved on it greatly, and I'll tell them one of these days I'm gonna get hundred dollars together and send it get later. But I am descended from the Cro-Magnon man, as is most Europeans. Now, as the Neanderthal man, now there's a big debate. Now, is he a separate species or is he the same species? Some recent studies have shown that if we got the right humans together, in other words, this human has 15%, because a lot of humans have Neanderthal DNA, we could recreate a Neanderthal man by getting the right humans together and uh, crossbreeding them until we eventually would reproduce a Neanderthal man. Um, as for their average height, to me it shows that modern man is degenerate. Now I have a zoology book at the house that I've had since 1967. It was my freshman year zoology book. And it's even the, the, the authors, who are very pro-evolution by the way, wondered, is modern man degenerate? About the size. Now, Human beings are gradually now getting larger once again. Why is this? It's not because of better diet. The answer may surprise you. It is because we are marrying over the horizon. We're, having, we're marrying strangers. What I mean by stranger? Someone who was born hundreds of miles away from us and who neither or nobody in our kith and kin knew. This actually is good for us genetically. Now, because in the olden time, particularly all over the world, People would marry in their own neighborhood. Well, after a while, man are marrying in your own neighborhood. After several generations, you might as well have been marrying your sisters. And they got, the humans got smaller and smaller and smaller. During the Middle Ages, the armor that the knights wore showed that the average height of the European male was four foot six. What makes modern man, modern European man bigger? Well, a bunch of them came to the United States. And the Swede married the Finn. And the Irish person married the, uh, a Scots person, Scottish person. Basically, they're married people whom they were not related to, and their offspring became bigger and bigger. Have any of you heard this before? Inbreeding is one of the words, yeah. Now, uh, and yes, this may sound very short, I mean, I'm not going to bother, but one of the reasons that more African people make the professional teams than European people is African people generally are more diverse in their ancestry. It's not that being black is better, what's better is the diversity. Um, and that's why you find pro football teams, 50% of the players who make a pro football team are black. And I mean that as a compliment, but we really do. We consider a man black if he has any black in his hand. Now, I'm not saying it's right. No, it's not right, but we do. Maybe Barack Obama had a black, I mean, had a white mother. We consider him a black man, but he had a white mother. I mean, we, 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 do the, we look on it that way. So, so yeah, again, uh, our black people are more diverse in their ancestry than most twice. So, uh, again, and then we are slowly getting back to the size of the, pre, of the pro magnon man and the Neanderthal man. Modern term for human being, Homo sapiens. Cavemen, I've already mentioned that. People have always lived in a cave. Uh, standard view is that man started out as a food hunter and food gatherer. Then he gradually learned to domesticate animals. He learned to plant crops. He domesticated sheep. Now, folks, I want to ask you about the sheep. 
there's no such thing as a wild sheep. Sheep are so dependent on humans and always have been to where I can't imagine that there ever was a sheep that was wild. I mean, somebody caught him one day and pinned him up and his descendants became... The fact is, sheep are so dependent on humans that they can't even find a place to drink from without being led to, a, to water. They can't find a pasture without some human leading them to a pasture. They can't fight off their enemies. Humans have to come in with their guns and knives and whatever and fight their eat the, the animals that would eat them up. They can't fight their enemies. Uh, and if you leave one on one side of a barn and walk around the barn and if he didn't fall, he can never find you. I mean, not like a cat. I mean, you turn a cat loose, you should put water out for it, but if you don't, you'll find water. They've been known to find their way more than a thousand miles. They lost, find their way home again. He can't even find their way around the corner of the barn. They've always been dependent. But nevertheless, according to the standard view, man learned how to domesticate animals somewhere along the way. Learned how to plant crops and folk again. I'm about the crop. Any of you who know anything at all about farming, with very few exceptions, the plants you eat, whether it be apple, peaches, corn, wheat, they only grow if you work them hard. I mean, you have to put them in the ground. You have to keep the weeds away. You have to hoe them, and if you don't, they amount to nothing. As for weeds, I mean, hey, they just grow up without any kind of tending at all, and they'll choke out your, they'll choke out your, the plants you want to grow. Again, some of you might know something about what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay, some of you know, yeah, but yeah, yes. Isn't that also, isn't that only true for the plant species of the ones that we usually see in grocery stores and stuff? Every, about every plant you see in the grocery store had to be cultivated and carefully. Oh yeah, well, you can crossbreed them and get what's called hybrids. Um, both, most, most of the plants in the grocery store are crossbred hybrids. Uh, corn, the corn we have is hybrid corn. Um, most tomatoes, hybrid tomatoes. Uh, you know, where you get uh, plants that are far distantly related and breed them together. Same thing you get with hand, with animals. I mean, you have uh, breed an animal who's very unrelated, and you'll get an offspring that's, uh, it's called hybrid vigor. The hybrids are, uh, tend to be stronger and better than the, uh, either of the parents were. Um, yeah, this just goes back to what I just said about uh, the cold magnet and the antitome man, how modern man is getting what bigger. It's not better diet, folks. It's uh, we're marrying over the horizon, in some cases over several horizons. I mean, I married a, I'll call her a stranger. My dad did too. Uh, my dad was a Pennsylvanian, married a Kentuckian. I married a Floridian. But uh, actually, uh, I was in Ohio before we were in Georgia, so no, I don't have a southern accent. So basically, we, we are marrying strangers. Now, that, that may not be good for us socially, but it is good for us genetically. All right. Um, what makes a civilization? Again, cities, religion, armies, social structure, writing. Arts, capital and wealth, all this makes for a civilization. Your primitive peoples, nomadic people wandering, oftentimes do not have any of this. Um, Gato Huyuk, I'll tell you what, uh, don't worry about the name. I mean, supposedly Gato Huyuk, we used to pronounce it Chato Huyuk, was the oldest city that has ever been found. It's said to be Paleolithic. Jericho has also been said to be the oldest city in the world. Jericho has fame from biblical times as being the city whose walls fell down. And by the way, you, you can read in one version and say that we have never found any evidence that any walls fell, but you can, I was there once. You can read another version who said, yes, here's the evidence, these walls right here did fall. The city was rebuilt after the walls fell several generations later, and some of the rubble was cleared away. Um, most of what we know about earlier history comes from archaeology. Archaeology, unlike written records, is where you study artifacts. Dig. Now, archaeology involves a lot of digging. Why is that? Because over time, dust and debris piles up and piles up and piles and piles up, particularly a city it's lived in. Now, in modern times, we will carry our garbage away and set it in the dump. But in those days, most of the garbage had dumped out in the street. And after a while, the street level would rise. Then the next generation would come along and 
they would build a house on top of their parents' house. And then in a few generations, they'd build another house on top of that house. And after a while, you have several layers of houses, one on top of the other. And you have mounds, and archaeologists have to come in and dig deep down to find out what each generation lived like and artifacts from each generation. Did this generation have writing? What kind of pottery did they have? How well did they fire their pottery? And very well fired clay pottery indicates a high le level of advancement, or poorly fired pottery with no artwork indicates a poor people. History, though, is about written records. Primary source, secondary source. Again, that's going to be your first pass, which will be next week, um, next Friday. The alternate view is that there was a past golden age, Garden of Eden, total perfection that man lost. Almost every ancient society believed that we had a golden age. Today's historians deny it, folks. Um, now, Plato talks about a lost continent of Atlantis, very, very advanced people that fell into the sea and was lost, and we have been looking for that lost continent ever since, and at times people will think that we found it. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean was named after Atlantis, and yes, our local city here, the big city of Atlanta, named after Atlantis. Um, Plato said it was just beyond the pillars of Hercules. Oh no, I could spend the rest of the semester talking about Atlantis, folks, but no, not. We have to move on. But uh, a lot of it's, it's, it's purely speculative. Now, flood story. By any chance, did any of you happen to watch the Ken Ham Bill Nye debates in February of last year? Yeah. Yeah. At least one of you is admitting you had last, well, last spring, nobody, but when it happened two years ago, I mean, a year ago, several of my students watched them. Bill Nye made a remark that there is no evidence that the flood ever happened. Every ancient society and folk, there are no exceptions, has a flood story. The Chinese have one, the African peoples have them, the Egyptians, the American Indians, and in all cases, the flood story had very few survivors. Some flood story, they're, they're slightly different. Some flood story mentioned birds that were sent out by the survivor, but in all cases, now in the case of the Greeks, their survivors climbed a tall mountain and they were rescued to last moment that God saw them on a tall mountain. Well, the biblical story talks about the ark landing on a tall mountain. So there's a mountain involved. But I want to say this about the flood story, folk. It's not just written in the ancient records. It is written in our DNA. I told you now, I had done a DNA check in my own DNA. Here's the National Geographic's DNA, well, here, they show, but, right, by the way, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna use the term race here. I mean, you see people of various colors. There is only one race, the human race. All humans are very, very close to related. In 1986, we made a startling discovery. All human females are descended from one woman. It's right here, folk. Does anybody have any idea what that means? Does anybody know what they call this woman? Not Lucy. I mean, I got ahead of the No, even more. It comes from a book that's not even allowed in our public school. So we need to give you a hand. Eve. Eve. <laughs> they call her Eve. Then, a few days later, they discovered that all human males are descended from one man. Obviously, they call him Adam. I mean, it's, it's right here, folk. They have figured that the original Eve and Adam and Eve started here in Africa. But there's one thing. Your human males are more closely related than the females. All right, why is that? Because since Eve lived, there was a catastrophe on earth that destroyed everybody except for one man 
and his sons, and yes, his wife, and the wives of his sons. Apparently, his sons' wives were not sisters. That's why that the female lines are more diverse than male lines. If the flood story, basically, folk, is written in our DNA. It's not just written in the ancient tablets, or the ancient or stories have been handed down, but it's also written in our DNA. If any of you want to take a close look, hey, look it up. Don't just say, oh, go look it up. Mitochondrial DNA. It's on the web. I've looked it up. Now, they'll give a different explanation. They don't want, most of the time, they don't want to admit. But it showed all human beings are descended from. Again, the original Eve, her husband might not have been Adam because to some extent, I mean, there was a second Adam named Noah, depending on what you believe. But even the experts are about ready to admit, I mean, some of that it looks like humanity underwent a huge, huge disaster somewhere back there that wiped out almost everyone. We do find, I'll be right, we do find seashell fossils on top of Mount Everest. All right, yes. What do you think about radiating? Because they're finding fossils really for okay. days of uh, Hey, listen, that is a load. I'm really glad you asked about radiocarbon dating. All right, folks, so it's like it's subject to interpretation. Now, if you find a bone, let's say a fossil bone, and you radiocarbon date it, in order to really know how old it is, number one, you have to know how much radiocarbon it had in it when it was alive. And this is true with radiometric rate. Now, radiometric date is where they date things that are not alive, rocks. You have to know how much radiocarbon did this bone have in it when it was alive. And then, has the rate of decay been constant? Now, at best, though, radiocarbon dates cannot give an age more than 50,000 years because at that point, the radiocarbon becomes so decayed that there would be no radiocarbon left. So the, the maximum is 50. Now, radiometric dating, they try to go back billions of years. But a lot of creationist science assume that the animals and plants at one time had a lot less radiocarbon than we do now that over time we absorb more radiocarbon because of radiation of the sun, so we have more. But they're assuming, when they find a fossil, oh, this creature, when it was alive, it had the same amount of radiocarbon in this system that all living things have now. But if it had less when it was alive, that means it's, going to, it's actually going to be a whole lot younger than the results that they get. And the same thing with radiometric dating. Radiometric is where they, they look at, the, it's called mother, element, and daughter. Now, most of you may have heard it, uranium slowly changes to lead. And a lot of other elements have isotopes that change from one element to another. But again, when you find these isotopes, you have to know how much was uranium and how much was lead to begin with. And every element we've created in the lab, the instance created, it's all automatically a million years old because it's, when we create it, we have this much mother and this much daughter element right there in the same place. So this really, uh, they, and also you have to assume that this thing you're measuring has been in a closed system. For instance, like, let's say this is a bone. You have to assume that this bone has been in a closed system, that no radiocarbon has ever flowed into it, or no radiocarbon has ever been taken away from it. Again, that's an assumption you can't make, because unless you pre carefully preserve this bone in a super closed type system, the rate of decay, I mean, it might have been influenced by some radiocarbon, might have been just seeped into the bone from an outside source. So, again, you have to take these states with again with a grain of salt. I hope I'm clear as well. I mean, I hope I'm clear on what I'm saying. All right. Um, now, after the flood, we have three, and that, again, that term racial, I don't like to use anymore, but three groups. Semitic from Shem, Ham, Hamitic from Ham, Japhetic, Aryan or Indo-European. Uh, again, from the, those, some of you may recognize these names, the three sons of Noah. And again, if you look on the map, folk, it looks like that they all branched, that humanity branched out. Now, they, they tell you that humanity branched out from Kenya and East Africa, but then went to the Middle East and then branched out again from the Middle East. Um, 
I am not keen on the idea of having started in Kenya and East Africa. That, to me, that's somewhat arbitrary. But nevertheless, I'm going to teach it because it is standard, and you, everybody needs to at least know what the standard uh, view of all these things are. Um, all right. Um, all right, now moving on, Sumer. Sumer is part of the Fertile Crescent. It's called a crescent because uh, it's, uh, well, it's crescent-shaped. It's, uh... Now this region here is the region of the Tigris, I mean, yeah, the, the Euphrates and the Tigris River. The Tigris is the East River. Euphrates is the uh, Western River. And these rivers is where I believe in mankind began. And over here is the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And in between here is a vast desert. But this area is called the Fertile Crescent, where the supposedly civilization began. Um, fertile means the land is arable or capable of growing crops. Keep that word in mind. I'll be using it again. Mesopotamia then is often called the cradle of civilization. Sumer was in the southern region of Mesopotamia, right in here, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers come together before going into the Persian Gulf. And again, if you have your book, those detailed maps. Yeah, Fertile Crescent is listed on page 10, at least in my book. And it shows the Tigris and Euphrates rivers coming together. And down at the south, there were, near where they come together is the land of Sumer and uh, North of Sumer was Akkad, and eventually Sumer and Akkad somewhat joined. All right, now, a big issue, and folks, my first graduate school paper was, where did the Sumerians come from? To this day, we don't know for sure, even though, uh, anyway, um, well, I started to say I think I know, but I'll, my head's still just, I can't quite prove it. But anyway, the Sumerians, they, um, speak a language that is not related to any language known. Now, uh, folk, there are a lot of languages that are not related to any other language. Now, I know what you've probably been taught, and I ran into this because last semester I assigned a paper, I picked a topic, and uh, a lot of students said that languages happen to change when you have a group of people here, move over here, and this group eventually starts speaking different dialect, wherever these people don't understand each other anymore. Well, that does not explain why there are hundreds of languages in the world today, and even some of those things like some of that have no affinity with any other language whatsoever. The issue was the story of the Tower of Babel. All right, I'm going to dive into the Tower of Babel because I had to see out. Two years ago, I mentioned Tower of Babel and one student raised his hand, Who's going to, that's not history, he's going to be teaching history. All right, it's not history. <laughs> the Tower of Babel, is, the story is not only found, folk, in the Bible, it's found in the Sumerian records where they tell a similar story. Now, call that history or not, and I want to say about the Sumerian records. Every ancient text we have, including the Bible, is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Oops, except for one group, the Sumerians. In the case of Sumerians, they wrote their records on clay tablets. Their clay tablets were buried for 3,000 years, and when we read a clay tablet, we're reading as original a source as you can get. In other words, these were not copied or they could have been changed. We're reading a time capsule. All right, what do they say? They say a whole bunch of stuff we don't believe, yes. So, if the Sumerian language is something that we don't have any language related to, how do we translate these tablets? Yeah. Oh, how we try? Okay, we have what we call Rosetta Stone. We have more Sumerian writings than we have of any writings from any other ancient group, no exceptions made. And among the writings are lexicons and dictionaries. And uh, they, they, this, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. But this tells something about how they. Uh, in fact, we actually think some of us can believe that if they could go back to Sumer, they could actually talk to the Sumerians. They, they pretty well know even how the words are pronounced. But there's something else unique about the Sumerian tongue. Um, when I was at Lockheed, I was in calibration. I had to use this symbol often. What's this symbol say? I mean, I don't mean to insult your tongue. What's this say? Uh, those of you can see it. Well, if you can't see it, I'll put it higher. 
What's that? Pounds. Pounds. Uh, mispronounced. Pounds. It is not spelled that way, folk. Now, the entire Sumerian language was written like this. What's the significance? All right, here's what I really think. You have an entire language that's written with symbols that do not have anything to do with the way we know they actually pronounce their words. Hold on your seats, which indicates that one morning they all woke up. They could still read their writings, but when they started talking to each other, they couldn't understand each other. And you know, some of you may have heard about a story like this. Like they could still read your writings. Now, again, other persons said, well, they probably copied for their language from another earlier language. Today, that one time we believe today, scholars say, oh, no, there was no proto Sumerian, there was no other language. The fact is, we don't know why they wrote like this. Now, this word, by the way, this comes from the Latin word libre, which we have English have borrowed, Latin word libre. And another example might be, now again, you don't have to, all of you know what that's here. But it's not pronounced the way it's actually. It's, it's not pronounced the way it's spelled. If you're part of that word is not even spelled right there. Nevertheless, it's a very commonly used English symbol. I mean, very commonly used, and all of you know what it means. But again, their entire language. It's like again, they woke up one morning and they could maybe understand the people in their own household went out to get to go to work, and they found they couldn't understand all the neighbors and so They said, "All scattered abroad." Again their, again, their language is not related to any other, and there are hundreds of aliens. The point I was trying to make to these pupils is, hey, you try to tell me that language is originated from people who moved apart and eventually have spoke a different dialect. In a lot of cases, this is true, but it doesn't explain the hundreds of languages there are that have no language kin, among them Sumerian. And there are hundreds of Basque is another one, a modern language like that. Korean is another one. Uh, languages that have no kin, no other language to kin to. Um, oh yeah, they probably sang the language, the tone, that means if you said a word in this tone, it meant one thing, and if you said a word in a higher tone, it meant something else. Uh, but they, uh, they were, it was tone. Um, They seem to have appeared suddenly and fully civilized. Now here's what the Sumerians will mean. They're supposed to be the most creative people on earth. What all did they invent? Well, among other things, the wheel. They domesticated the sheep, the goat, the camel, the horse, the dog, the cat. Um, and what else? They, well, did I mention the goat? And um, let's see, they, they also domesticated wheat barley, oats, the grains, um, the pig. In other words, these people, I mean, they were creative. They also believed to accept the first schools. We'd have a clay tablet that's written in very poor cuneiform, but on this tablet is a big, big X, <laughs> which probably indicates that some young kid wrote in very poor cuneiform and his teacher got really and just wrote a big X across the clay tablet, um, and it's been preserved to this day. But apparently they had schools, they had government, they had armies, they had kings, and they had religion. Now, folk, we have more writings from the Sumerians than we have about the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, all combined. And folk, we can't consider what they say serious history because we do not believe what they have told us. What did they tell us? They told us that the gods had a, not spiritual, a physical presence in their temples and that their gods walked the streets daily and were a part of their society. We cannot accept that in the modern world. We can't handle that in serious history. And our gods would sometimes cohabit with human women at all, but already said and produce hybrids, um, half human and half God. This they told us. That's why their work is not considered serious history. Now I can go into more detail. They have a case of a story of in Merkar in Merkar and Lukabanda, 
Lugabanda, and Merakar was the one king who went to war against the city of Arata. But in Mer Lugabanda became sick. When Lugabanda became sick, he uh, called on the gods. The gods came and they feasted with him and restored him to health. But Lugabanda could sense the evil of these gods. I mean, you know, I think personally these gods were demons, but they would less be, be of what it may have upset more than intended to say already. But nevertheless, they restored him to health. And they sent along an Apsu bird, and the Apsu bird endowed him with super speed where he was able to catch up with his army. And when he couldn't win the fight, uh, he volunteered. He didn't want to give away to his king that he had super speed. He volunteered to go back to the city of Uruk and get a message from the goddess Inanna, who was living in Uruk at the time. And so he used his super speed once he got out of Cyclops. Went back to Uruk in a hurry, a thousand mile trip at least. Got him some help from Inanna. Went back and blew the city to smithereens you know, that he was that they were fighting against. Now, folk, this story, I mean, look it up. Luca Banda and uh, in, Mer in Merikar and Luca Banda in the land of Arata. This is one of their many stories. All right. Did they have nuclear warfare? Now, folk, I want to turn your attention to page 12. Those of you who have the book. I'll read it for those of you who don't. Ur is destroyed. Bitter is its lament. The country's blood now fills its holes like hot bronze in a mold. Bodies dissolve like fat in the sun. Our temple is destroyed. The gods have abandoned us like migrating birds. You know, basically the gods flew off like migrating They believe the gods had the power to fly, by the way. Um, smoke lies on our city like a shroud. Maybe like a mushroom cloud. Now, when we dropped our bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of World War II, they were said that the bodies just disintegrated, like a dissolved. Eyes fell out of the sockets. I mean, it sounds terrible. If you take this literally, folk, and we don't, the only kind of weapon that could do this kind of damage is a nuclear bomb. And there's evidence all over the globe that nuclear bombs were once used in warfare. <coughs> We'll talk about this again when we come to the city of Ohenjo Dara. And that was the one paper I had assigned last semester on pupils. Um, now, when you see something like the gods have abandoned us, like migrating birds have taken flight, you think this is poetic language. Or do they mean that the gods actually had a physical presence and they could see them running away from the city and flying away? Again, if you look this up on the internet, I mean, this is a very famous quote here, and you can just look up Ur is destroyed. They'll tell you, oh, this is a lament. And the Bible, Book of Lamentations, is took up where this left off, and this is just a lament, a poem. And in fact, your author's writing is a poem. To me, it's an original source book. This was written 3,000 more years ago, buried and dug up, and what we're reading is a pure, unabridged, unexaggerated format. That has not been all over a chain since it was written more than 3,000 years ago. Yes? Um, is it possible that maybe instead of like what they thought as gods, were they more like powerful, almost like celebrities, like powerful humans? In other words, very humans who were advanced. Well, all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's possible. Okay. In other words, that's, that's super advanced humans built up an advanced civilization, and then they started warring with, warring with each other. And in the process of the war, they used nuclear weapons which they had. I mean, some people believe that our ancestors, our ancestors, human ancestors, actually traveled to planets. Um, and were very, very, very extremely advanced. But, but yes? How would you relate that to the giants that walked upon the Earth? That what? The giants. Well, the, well, that's what I'm getting. The yeah, giant story. Giant stories are found, just like dragon stories. Every, I mean, 
Uh, the Chinese, one of their symbols of zodiac is a dragon. Um, dragon giants are found all over the globe. Now, either again, they were figments of man's imagination. I mean, there's some things that all humanity has in common. Of course, I've already been, human, all humans have a flood story. All humans have a seven day a week cycle, with the seventh day being a day of rest. And we're finding out if you don't take a day of rest, you're going to wear yourself out fast. The seven day a week cycle, the zodiac, that usually consists of 12 symbols. They're not all the same symbol, but it says 12 symbol zodiac. Um, and dragon stories, giant stories. Stories of a paradise we lost. These kind of stories are found all over the globe. And again, we don't you don't have to believe them, but they are there. So uh, alright. Um, now, some people have said that the Sumerians did not really call their leaders gods that they really just looked on them as being beings from another world, or like you said, early advanced humans who were more advanced than the other humans. But according to their own mythology, the first of their gods was the one named An or Anu. And eventually Anu ceased to be worshipped and was replaced by Enkidu. We have these names, by the way, are online. And eventually uh, Anu, Enkidu, their worship fell by the wayside also. And, he was followed by Marduk, we know of as Mars, son of Enki. Um, the Sumerians fell by the wayside, no longer existed. Again, uh, what I've written here, I've, I wrote several years ago. I'm not as certain of it now as I once was. They called them the Anunnaki because they were descended from Anu. The word Anunnaki comes from Anu. Eventually, Mortals came along and they occupied the thrones. Like in the case of Gilgamesh, he supposedly ruled Uruk for 120 years. Then when he died, his son ruled for only 30 years, though his son was no, no longer part god. So, uh, but the first, supposedly the first kings were gods followed by demigods. You know, it was half god and half man. Um, the Sumerians and the Babylonians did not think of their kings as being god. The Egyptians believed that their rulers were. Now again, I'm not as certain what I just said here at the bottom, I mean next about Uranus and Neptune. I'm not as certain of that as I once was. Some authors will say that, oh yeah, they had they included planets Uranus and Neptune in their um, in their uh, drawings of the solar system. Others say there's an alternate interpretation. Um, and speaking of the planets, have any of you been following the progress of our satellite? One of them is now orbiting Ceres, and another one is fast on its way to Pluto. Any of you been following that? We're finding something on Ceres that we can't explain. Lights. Look at us. You saw, yeah, lights. Mysterious lights that we haven't found anywhere else. That, uh, uh, again, um, something we cannot quite understand. Anyway, um, now, the center of their life was the city-state. Um, the chief Sumerian cities were Ur, Uma, Uruk. Ur is a city I just talked about, folk, and any of you who know anything at all about Jewish history, Ur was a city of Abraham, or Abraham. And according to some scholars, Abraham was told to get out of the city and he got out just before the big destruction occurred. And we now, if you talk about something burning, these cities were made out of clay because it's like the only thing that grew there in my part of the expression. Their streets were clay, their buildings were clay, their writing, they wrote on clay. Now, how do you get clay to make a hot fire? We're going to come to the same problem when it comes to the city of Mohenjo-Daro <coughs> in India. And again, pardon me, recovering from a bow, long bow of cold. But anyway, uh, um, how do you get clay to burn? Now, these people have had a lot of clay, a lot of brick. Um,
Gilgamesh, now, we do not yet consider Gilgamesh to be true history. Even though a lot has been written about him, you'll find him in a lot in your literature books anymore. Um, and I compare Gilgamesh to King Arthur, Robin Hood, <coughs> Beowulf. Folk, we do find some evidence that these people actually existed. Who is the first historical character? When I was a kid, and even before, they called him Hammurabi. Then they finally decided, no, before Hammurabi, there was Sargon. Today, your book does admit that ur Namu of Ur is the first historical character. Now, this is from an earlier version of your author. Your authors today leave that part off. Um, don't worry about memorizing the name ur Namu. Um, Lou Gals, I guess, see, I mean, hey, now, folk, if this were a course on Sumer, and believe me, I could teach an entire semester on nothing but Sumer, Sumerian history, we would spend a whole day talking about Lugal Zagisi, and then another whole day talking about Sargon, who came after him. But we don't. Uh, the name Sargon, I really would like you to remember. Um, Sargon and he had a grandson, Naram-Sin, both of whom were really, really mighty rulers. Then the dynasty declined, as is the case of all these dynasties. A powerful ruler was set up. Last a few generations, then would come a weaker ruler. Babylon eventually replaced all these others, and the main king of Babylon is Hammurabi. Hammurabi is remembered for his law code. His law code is a lot like the law of Moses, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He conquered all of the region of Mesopotamia in just 30 years. He conquered one city, got it on its side, then conquered another and got that dose to its side. He'd pick out which city seemed to be weak or having trouble would go in and he'd say, I can straighten out the mess. He'd conquer that city also. And after a while, he'd, after 30 years, he had all of the uh, whole area under one empire. Regrettably, it did not last. All right, we'll leave Sumer. And go to Egypt before we do.